What is going on everyone? Welcome back to the world according to Briggs. Have you ever wondered how a town collapses or becomes a ghost town? I know I did. Then I did some reading. There are more than a few reasons a town fails. Sometimes it's things like a natural disaster or it could be a man-made disaster like Centralia, Pennsylvania's mine fire. Most of the time it's a company shutdown that the town depended on. Sometimes it's a gradual thing and sometimes it's overnight. In my missing persons video, I talked about a whole town that just up and left within a couple weeks back during the depression. That type of thing happened a lot. Industries just went away and so did the people. But this one was kind of weird because nobody knew anyone was leaving. They just all left. The United States is filled with boom and bust towns along our history. There's some cities right now that are struggling to stay afloat because an industry failed in that area. Detroit's a perfect example. They're getting better, but they're almost a ghost town for a long time. Today's list is about 10 towns that disappeared because of a single company or industry that they depended on for work. In a nutshell, it's company towns that failed when the company folded. Now I'm going to tell you up front that these towns have very little presence on the internet. So as far as pictures and video, I'll be using some footage uh, from the area as best I can. So don't be expecting like pictures of the town. Some of them have been gone since the depression. That being said, why don't we take a look at my top 10 towns destroyed by losing a single employer. Number 10. Graysonia, Arkansas the company? Arkadelphia Lumber. Graysonia was once home to the largest lumber mill in the South. It had over a thousand workers handling their wood. Graysonia was built by the Arkadelphia Lumber Company founder William Grayson in 1907. Yeah, he named a town after himself. It had a firehouse, several hundred houses, a restaurant, a cafe, three hotels, a theater, a school, a church, a running water system, a baseball field, a park, and electricity. Life was good in Graysonia. That was until the Great Depression wiped the whole place out. Arkadelphia went out of business business and an entire town was out of work. By 1951, the last resident had left. His name was Charlie. Nobody told him they were leaving. He showed up for softball practice and nobody was there. Now there's a few structures left in an old railroad bridge, but that's about it. The rest is just a memory. If you look at the Google Maps thing, you could see the outline of some of the buildings, but that's about it. Number nine, Marktown, Indiana. The company? Mark Manufacturing. Built more than a century ago by industrialist Clayton Mark, who manufactured steel pipes and tubes, Marktown was built to keep its workers. It doesn't sound like a bad deal from everything I've read. You get paid and you have a nice home. These homes were nice, not some rundown tent city. The houses were made of brick and finished with stucco and painted bright colors. They all had running water, coal-fed furnaces, and a full basement. From all accounts, it was a nice place to live. Here's the thing, it's still there, sort of. They are now part of a town called East Chicago, Indiana, not too far. It's like between Gary, Indiana and Chicago. Anyway, if you look at it from Google Earth, you have this little patch of green in the middle of this large industrial area. It looks kind of strange. I checked and there's a couple three bedroom, one bath homes for sale here, all under $30,000. I was thinking, wow, that's a good deal. They don't look bad once you get past the boarded up windows. And then I saw the pictures of the inside. One of them looked like they had trapped a crazy person in there with nothing but whiskey, a sledgehammer and a box of spray paint. Now at its peak, 14,000 people lived here. These days, it's about 3,000, and it's getting fewer and fewer all the time. Marktown's 200 homes were almost destroyed for a highway project some years back. Many of the homes are in bad shape, but they've plowed a couple of them over to make a nice little green space and, you know, park near the refineries. <sighs> Number eight, Brewston, Tennessee. The company, Henry I. Siegel. The Henry I. Siegel company used to make jeans and suits in three plants in Brewston, Tennessee, employing more people than the town actually had to offer. At its peak, they had 1,700 people in the 1980s working at the three different plants. The town's population was only about 1,400 at the time, so, you know, they were drawn in from other communities as well. The town was booming for years. Everyone had a job that wanted a job, and the jobs paid okay. Things changed in the late 1980s, and fewer and fewer people had jobs at the plant. It laid off its last 55 workers in 2000. The plants are empty and growing vines now. The bank is gone, two supermarkets are gone, the clothing store is gone, a pharmacy is the only thing hanging on. In 2005, Ohio-based Purity Foods moved in here, but it's since gone out of business as well. Population has been declining for years and the future looks pretty grim. These days, anyone still living here is probably retired on social security or works out of town. 
Number seven, Livermore, New Hampshire. The company, Grafton County Lumber Company. Lumber towns live fast and die young, sort of like a goldfish. Founded in 1876 by a pair of lumber tycoon brothers, Daniel and Charles Saunders, the town was named for Samuel Livermore, a former United States Senator who was the grandfather of Daniel Saunders' wife. The town of Livermore suffered through gross mismanagement, fire, floods, storms, and deforestation until the last mill closed in 1926. The population dropped from around 200 in 1900 to about 23 in 1930. By 1949, the last resident left. But get this, in the 2000 census, three people lived there. I don't know what was going on there. It had been 50 years since the place had had any residents. I mean, aside from the occasional hippie commune in the 1960s or something. You know what? That is an untapped business. Hippie commune, Airbnb, or timeshare, actually. Wonder if you can get a loan for that. Anyway, as far as the three people living there in 2000, I figure some census worker was having a slow day, saw three hobos walking down a dirt road. When he drove by, he yelled, You're going in the book! Today, the surrounding forest is taking it back. No word on the hobos. <sighs> Number six, Batstow Village, New Jersey. The company, Batstow Ironworks. Back in 1766, the Batstow Ironworks was using bog ore dug up from the beds and banks of nearby rivers to make household pots and kettles. If you've ever seen rusty mud in a creek, swamp, or pond, you've seen bog ore. It also began making supplies for the Continental Army during the American Revolution, but spent more than a century afterwards producing household goods and giving employees the run of the company's store, blacksmiths, mills, barns, and stables. In the mid-1800s, the demand for iron declined and Batstow turned to glass making. That didn't last long because people really weren't smoking a lot of weed yet, so there was really no need for blown glass. Have you ever noticed like one out of every five 20-year-old stoners wants to become a professional glass blower? I don't know how many I've run into that say that to me. It's just really weird. Anyway, so soon Batstow was in bankruptcy and you had a whole bunch of glass blowers with no glass to blow. The last permanent resident left in 1989 and the town of Batstow has been a New Jersey historic site ever since. <sighs> Number five, Segundo, Colorado. The company, Colorado Fuel and Iron. The story of a coal and iron mining town is the story of a dying town. And that's the story of Segundo, Colorado. Segundo is actually two different places thanks to the position of a couple mines. This is another town that depended on iron mining. And as the demand for iron declined, so did the need to keep iron miners employed. Segundo's last mining operation shut down in 1960. Segundo is actually Spanish for second, as in two, get it? Okay, anyway, moving on. There's nothing out here but mining. If you weren't a miner in this town, you were the wife or a kid of a miner. At its peak, Segundo is thought to have had about six or 700 residents. Today, the population has fallen below 100, and the few people that do come here, they come here for the hiking and wildlife viewing, and that's about it. Segundo's a dying town. <sighs> Number four, Pullman, Illinois. The company, the Pullman Palace Car Company. In 1884, George Pullman built a manufacturing complex and town on about 4,000 acres of land south of Chicago. This was to house his employees, making his luxury rail sleeping cars. While the plan was to keep the workers happy, which would increase productivity and draw skilled workers away from Chicago, it didn't quite work out that way. The town had more than 1,000 homes with yards, indoor plumbing, gas, and daily trash removal, and drew about 12,000 residents. However, the downside was the workers could only rent their homes, they could be evicted at any time, they couldn't hold meetings, couldn't go to bars, and couldn't read books or watch performances other than those offered by the library or town theater. Does anyone get the feeling George Pullman was a bit of a control freak? When Pullman cut wages after an economic downturn in 1894, a workers' strike turned violent, and as a result, federal troops were called in to kind of knock things down. After Pullman himself died in 1897, Illinois required the company to sell the town. In 1889, it was annexed to the south side of Chicago. The neighborhood went into a slow decline, and the factory was finally closed in 1957. It's taken the neighborhood a while to recover, but it was declared a national monument in 2015. So that's kind of cool. <sighs> Number three, Lynch, Kentucky. The company, U.S. Coal and Coke. Tucked away in the hills outside of Cumberland, Kentucky, you have the small town of Lynch. It wasn't always a small town. In fact, it was a good-sized town for a lot of years, and everyone was working for U.S. Coal and Coke. This Coke is a mineral, not a drink or a party drug that was extremely popular in the 1980s. Lynch was built in 1917 by U.S. Coal and Coke, a subsidiary of U.S. Steel. This town had a population of about 10,000 people in the 1940s, had its own grocery store, theater, hospital, 
hospital and hotel. Even as recently as 1980, nearly 1,600 people still live there. However, in 2016, there were fewer than 700 residents. This is another one of those situations where most of the people living in Lynch are either retired or have a good drive out of town for work. Now, they do have a mine tour, if that's your thing. You can take a look at Lynch's mining past while its future continues to dwindle. So there's a prime opportunity to, you know, buy a house here, get a nice mortgage. You need some sunblock, though. I'm sure the homeowner's insurance is dirt cheap out here. <sighs> Number two, Thompson Springs, Utah. The company, the coal mining company, settled as a town of ranchers in the 1880s. Thompson Springs got a boost when coal mining began in a canyon north of town in 1911. That year, a rail line was branched out from the tracks that ran by Thompson Springs to the mine itself. The town was booming and everyone had a new pickaxe and hammer. The town was served by various passenger rail lines for much of the town's history. In 1996, Amtrak moved the last of its local services to nearby Green River, which pretty much killed any reason anyone ever would have to visit Thompson Springs. I'll tell you who should visit Thompson Springs, a junk removal company. This place is a joke. Most of the yards look like they double as a scrap yard. Everyone seems to have a broken down trailer too. I don't know what that's all about. With the mine closing in the 1950s, Interstate 70 taking travelers away from the town in 1970, and the rail services going away in the 1990s, Thompson Springs spent the last couple decades withering and dying, like a grape with no water. According to the 2010 census, just 39 residents remain. I don't know if you'll be able to find them amongst all that scrap metal. And number one, Gilman, Colorado. The company, the Eagle Mining Company, founded by judge and prospector John Clinton in 1886, you know, I read a lot of history about this country, and one of the most common titles a successful person has from the 1800s is judge. They all seem to be a judge someplace. I wonder if that has anything to do with their success. Who knows? The town got a rail spur in 1899 and rode the silver boom like a wild horse. Gilman had its own newspaper, a boarding house, and a school. The mines were active into the 1970s, and the town eventually got a clinic, a grocery store, and a bowling alley. Only two lanes, so no big tournaments going on there. However, years of poor mining technique led to the Environmental Protection Agency to evacuate the town completely in 1984 and declared a Superfund site in 1986. It took 24 years to clean up the site, but it's been over a decade since it's supposed to be turned into a ski resort. That project cleared an EPA hurdle in 2018, so maybe changes are not gonna happen. Who knows? If they do start a resort here, I'm going. We'll all have a big meetup. All right, so that is my top 10 towns destroyed by losing a single employer. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you got some information out of it. This one's kind of interesting. I kind of liked it. Anyway, don't forget all the links below. Give the video a big thumbs up. Tell me what you thought about the video. If you haven't subscribed, please do so, and hit that little bell notification so you know when I'm uploading. Everybody have a great day. Be nice to each other.